Welcome back, traders and investors. We have Gordon Johnson, Head of Alternative Energy Research and Managing Director at Axiom Capital Management. Gordon, how you doing this morning? Good, good. How are you? Ah, uh, we're doing okay here. Uh, just want to just hop into you know some of these stocks that you cover, and one that's really been in the news lately uh, came out with uh, some favorable guidance uh, into the future. Uh, First Solar uh, just exploded on that news. Uh, seemed to be getting a little little consolidation here uh, between seventy and seventy five. Uh, what's uh, what's your take on First Solar here? Yeah, I mean, the company gave 2014 guidance last year, um, and they came out and cut the 2014 guidance, the EPS, by 26%, and the cash nearly in half. And if you listen to the first part of the management presentation at their guidance day, they were very defensive, yet the stock was up massively on uh, guidance they're giving for 2016 um, uh, and, and, and 2015. So, they didn't have great visibility and couldn't hit their 2014 numbers, but somehow the market's giving them credit for what they're going to do in 2015 and 2016. Um, you know, I think that there's major issues with this company. Um, they're guiding, um, what people got excited about is they're guiding in 2017 their efficiency to be up from 17% versus roughly 13% now. If you go four years back, the company was at 12% efficiency and they have a new CTO, so somehow they're going to make leaps and bound gains there, um, which, you know, I guess the market's crediting them for, and they're saying their costs are going to be 40 cents a watt, um, uh, 40 cents a watt. Yet, if you go back to last year at um, Sun Edison's um, guidance day, they said that by 2016, they'd have technology that was 21% efficient at 40 cents a watt on the crystal and silicon side. So it's a matter of who you believe on the technology. With respect to um, their earnings potential, again, they, they cut their EPS significantly for 2014. So we're just in a situation where you know investors are believing anything the company says and forgetting about what their competitors are saying, who, by the way, um, are completely um, 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 uh, – uh, killing them from a competitive standpoint. If you look at the projects that have been won in the United States, uh, Copper Mountain 3 was awarded to effectively Trina Solar, whereas First Solar had done Copper Mountain 1 and Copper Mountain 2. And uh, Sun Edison just bid on a project in Texas, a 150-megawatt project, for below $0.05 cents a kilowatt hour, um, i.e. the PPA, uh, which we don't think anybody can compete with. So I think people are getting ahead of themselves in this stock. I think people are giving them credit for things that they haven't proven um, and even if they do prove, if you look at the technology roadmaps of the competitors, um, they'll still be at a significant disadvantage. And lastly, if you look just simply at their sell of modules into the open market, i.e. stuff they're not selling to themselves, uh, their sales of modules into the third-party open market are down 81% from calendar 1st Q13 to calendar 4 Q13. So that shows you that demand for their product uh, is dismal. So I think that, uh, you know, we think there's significant downside for this stock. I don't think people understand it. Um, and, and the company can keep providing two-year-out forecasts, but I think as they continue to disappoint those forecasts, I think the stock heads lower. Okay. Uh, so you see nothing in the fundamentals that have changed to validate this move. Uh, perhaps, uh, you know, like you said, uh, uh, the streak giving them credit for just anything that they say and people looking for. Uh, well, no, I, I don't. Because you, you, the thing is, they have a, they, at the end of that presentation, they have something called a safe harbor um, comment, which states that they don't have to hit their targets. So why can't one of their competitors on the crystal and silicon side come out and say, we're going to be at 22% and 40 cents costs by 2015 or 2016. I mean, why can't they state what they're trying to achieve very aggressively? Um, they can, and they probably will. And when they do that, I think a lot of this optimism uh, will come out of the stock. Okay, and uh, sticking with the $29 price target on it, uh, just from a technical standpoint, I mean, I'm looking at this, and it had just the monster run up here, and now you're getting some consolidation. So uh, if you're looking for this thing to break down, I think under the $70 level, um, I know you don't cover it, but, uh, you know, this uh, this uh, solar power has just been all over the map here, and they just, you know, if you're thinking these stocks move together in the same sector, you're wrong. Uh, Goldman had an upgrade of this stock and a downgrade of First Solar. Uh, that took it down. Now uh, Solar City's kind of coming back to roost. Uh, you see, see some similar problems uh, with that company? 
Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, what does Solar City do? They're a roofing company. They put solar panels on your rooftop. How are they different than anybody else? Listen, the reason why people are getting excited about U.S. solar companies is because of the idea of a yield co. And what that creates is it creates a lower cost of capital for solar projects. But you need about at least 500 megawatts of projects that you built on balance sheet, which means that's about two billion dollars. I'm sorry, a billion dollars that you need to spend of projects that are connected and generating cash flow. That's something that no one but Sun Edison has. Uh, but everybody's saying they're going to do this. The problem is the economics on the projects today are far worse than the economics on the projects from 2008 when natural gas prices were 10 bucks. They're four bucks today. So the cash flows on these projects today are nowhere near the cash flows on the projects um, of yesteryear. And more importantly, if you look at the PPA, Sun Edison signed on this you know, 150 megawatts um, of projects in Texas at under five cents a kilowatt hour, um, there's no way that's profitable for pretty much everybody in the solar industry. Maybe Sun Edison has something special. Uh, we're trying to look into that, that that allows them to be profitable on a PPA that low. But PPAs that low, that, that's a negative cash flow project. So even if you were to put that into a yield co, it wouldn't be generating cash. So what's happened is a lot of these U.S. solar stocks, all they have to do is say yield co, and the stock's up 10% because investors give them credit for you know, projects that are profitable in those yield codes. But the problem is the projects being signed today are not profitable. And more importantly, for a yield co valuation to really work, you have to assume that a company is able to do a, yield, a new yield co every single year which is a lot of solar projects, incremental solar projects that need to be done. Um, and I just don't know if you have the demand for that, given the investment tax credit is slated to be cut significantly right. beginning 2017. And there was a bill introduced yesterday uh, by two Republican politicians, which is arguing for an end to the investment tax credit next year. Oh. And keep in mind, we have midterm elections in the U.S. here coming up, and the Democrats appear to be significantly behind. So if the Republicans take the Senate, um, that could have very negative implications for solar, the investment tax credit, and net metering rules, i.e. solar guys who can afford solar selling their excess power back to the grid, thus causing the poor people who can't afford it to pay for this uh, excess power. It's effectively a regressive tax on the poor. There's a lot of things that have gone in favor of the solar industry that um, you know, there are risks that, that are risks out there, and none of that's priced into the stocks. Okay, and just uh, going back to the first solar real quick, uh, how do you come up with that $29 price target? Yeah, we, we simply take what we think their EBITDA is going to be. Um, it's actually, we actually have a higher number in 2014 than we do in 20, um, I'm sorry, 2015 than we do in 2014, But so we're using our 2015 EBITDA number, putting a six times multiple on that. Um, so that, that EV to EBITDA multiple we're giving them gives them credit for their cash. Whereas before we were using a multiple of earnings, we think it appropriate to give them credit for that cash. The problem is they start building projects on balance sheet. That cash is going to come down pretty quickly, but nonetheless, giving them credit for their cash, putting a six times, actually, I'm sorry, six and a half times, um, EV to EBITDA multiple, what we think their EBITDA is going to be. We come up with a $29 target based on their shares outstanding. Okay, so what do you like out there in the sector? Um, well, we like JA Solar. Um, it's a stock that's come under pressure recently. Uh, this is a company that, you know, I, I don't want to say it's the, the, the best of the worst. It, they're actually a pretty good um, a company from a balance sheet perspective. If you look at their balance sheet, they have by far the strongest balance sheet out of all the Chinese solar companies. The company has significantly underperformed everybody, including Ying Li. Ying Li is losing money. J.A. Solar is making money. Ying Li has about $2 billion in debt. J.A. Solar has about $200 million in debt. Um, and, and Ying Li still has gross margins close to you know, single digits, whereas uh, J.A. Solar has uh, you know, mid-teens gross margins. The problem with J.A. Solar has been that it's a company that has historically had lower margins than the rest of the group, and we think that's because of its business, i.e. selling cells to OEMs, whereas those costs are included in your cost of goods sold, whereas the guys who sell modules um, uh, to the end customer, those costs are included in their sg &A. So it was just a semantic issue. The people thought J.A. Solar was a worse operator. But now that this company has a better, um, uh, a better, a better in input into uh, Japan, they're the leader of, um, of the Chinese module manufacturers in Japan, which is a higher ASP market, we think their margins are going to be maintained in the mid-teens kind of teens level. And the stock has been a massive underperformer of the rest of the solar stocks, yet fundamentally it's probably the best. 
So I think there's some catch up and some, um, you know, um, better understanding of the stocks needed in the market. That's the one that we like the best. Is this company? And we have a buy rating and a sixteen dollar target on. It. Right, I see that. Do they, are they uh, uh, as dependent on subsidies from the government as like a company like First Solar? Every solar company is dependent on subsidies. I mean. If the ITC in the U.S. ends, Solar City stock probably gets cut in half. Literally, people value it on a on a on a on a net present value basis, and the bulk of that, a lot of that valuation, is based purely on you know tax credits from the government. This is a company that's received half a billion dollars from the government and has never made a profit. You're right. Okay. And those subsidies are slated to get either end or get cut significantly in 2017. Look, these these stocks, a lot of these stocks are momentum plays, and as quick as they go up, they will eventually go down. It's a very scary endeavor um, if you don't fully understand what you're invested in. I think a lot of people are piling into these things on the thought that, hey, solar is the future. Um, But if you look at any country that's done solar in a big way, be it Germany, Italy, Spain, the Czech Republic, Greece, um, uh, you know, and the list goes on, the countries that have done solar in a big way have all ended up significantly reducing their incentives and probably 80 percent of them have introduced retroactive cuts meaning solar panels that got installed years back are now getting less of an incentive on the 20-year life these solar systems have a 20-year life and when they get an incentive from the government that incentive is paid every year for 20 years governments go back and cut those incentives so all the investors and the economics and the, the prices and everything that was sold into those panels was on the assumption that that incentive wouldn't be cut those incentives are getting cut retroactively in a number of countries and i think the same thing will befall japan the same thing will eventually befall china and eventually the us as well because solar is exorbitantly more expensive than fossil fuel when people talk about grid parity um, it, it, they're talking about the production cost of solar at the peak peak time of the day, i.e., when the sun is the brightest, versus the production cost of fossil fuels, which is you know that's the production cost over the entire day. The point is, when the sun goes down, you don't get solar power. Uh, so you, you, when it, people say you're replacing, you know, 200 homes are replacing fossil fuel, that's very misleading because because you're not. You're replacing fossil fuel at a certain time of the day. You're not replacing fossil fuel for the entire day. You can't you, you so solar is peak load um, uh, distributed power, whereas natural gas n- nuclear is base load um, distributed power. You can't replace base load distributed with peak load intermittent power. It's it's just not possible, and I think it's a misunderstanding in the market. I don't think politicians fully understand this, but it's just it, it's it's actually quite simple, right? When you have the, when the sun goes down, there's no more solar power, so you switch to a natural gas combustion turbine. The benefit that the guys who put it on their panel, on their roofs get, right, with this net metering, is they don't pay for that switchover cost. And they also don't pay for using um, the uh, natural gas grid. The, 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 basically, their neighbors are the people in their communities who are also paying electricity who don't have solar panels pay for that. So that's really why I think once some realistic, you know, um, people start to look at this, you're going to get more aggressive net metering rules, which clearly that's negative for solar as well. And so you're not worried about, you know, running out of the fossil fuels or, you know, there's still abundant supply of that. And uh, so, I mean, that's probably another fundamental argument that, that people look at for the need for solar power. There's hundreds of years worth of natural gas. And with fracking, there's even more, uh, uh, more, more of that left. Uh, nuclear energy is a renewable energy source that is reliable and has been proven as a generated baseload power. Um, look, the, you, you know, again, if you go to the countries that have done solar in a big way, all of them have significantly cut their incentives or completely gotten rid of them. And there was, there's been studies done in Spain and Germany that suggest that the solar power has not helped the environment. Um, uh, there has not been a significant reduction in CO2 emissions. And in some places in Germany, you've actually had an increase. Um, so, look, I, you can make all these blanket statements, and, you know, the solar industry will argue that the coal industry is just talking its book. But the reality is this. This is the reality. Besides all the blanket statements, solar power cannot replace natural gas or any fossil fuel-based electricity or nuclear energy. It has to be some combined form of power because you can't get power from solar at night. Solar is exorbitantly more expensive than natural gas. Um, If you look at the entire cost over the entire day, i.e. not just the cost of solar at peak times, 
but you also have to look at the natural gas combustion turbine that has to sit next to the solar plant when there's sun, when the, you know there's cloud cover, or when right. you know, we're dealing with nighttime. You have to look at the cost of the utility pipe. Uh, I'm sorry, the transmission uh, lines that will have to be new, re- replaced if we really do implement large-scale solar. You have to look at the margin for the solar company, the margin for the utility. When you add all that in, you could literally give the panel away for free, and you're still not at grid parity. Uh, not to mention. Yep, go ahead. No, I just I see you also have a uh, a sell rating here on uh, U.S. Steel that's had a nice run from uh, the twenty four mm-hmm. almost to the twenty eight dollar level. Uh, what, what what's yep. your what's your thesis here on uh, on uh, U.S. Steel? Yeah, I mean, you have the reason why U.S. Steel has went from twenty four to twenty eight is because HRC spot prices went from six eighty to six. 20 in a matter of a less a little over a month so hrc spot prices collapsed and whenever prices collapse guess what happens the u.s steel mills come out and announce price hikes and when they announce those price hikes investors buy the stock and in addition to that aks ak steel came out and missed numbers so did Nucor, and the stocks actually went up because they missed numbers uh, because people are saying buy the dips, you know, because people don't care about missing numbers. So these price hike announcements from the U.S. steel mills, as well as companies missing numbers and people buying the dips, is why the stock is higher. That's not what we do. We're fundamental analysts. We predict we predict what companies going to earn are going to earn and put a multiple on those earnings, and that's what we think the stock is worth. I think U.S. steel is about to miss earnings this quarter. I think they're going to miss earnings next quarter due to weakness in the automotive market as well as weakness in their OCTG market. They lost the case. Well, they haven't lost the case, but the preliminary ruling on the the, uh, tariffs on Korean um, OCTG um, companies was effectively no tariff. So that was um, not expected by the market. So that the, you continued to have exports of OTG into the United States, and, and despite what you know, all the U.S. steel mills claim with respect to the OC, you know, the Korean guys um, dumping uh, oil country tubular goods into the United States, all all of the U.S. companies for the most part are still profitable in their um, OCTG segments. So the, the the argument isn't robust from that standpoint. Look, here's the here's the point. Right now, U.S. HRC prices are at roughly a hundred dollar premium particularly if these price hikes stick, which, by the way, we're hearing they're not. If you look at HRC prices on Bloomberg, when these price hikes were announced, they were 630. They went down to 621 after the price hikes, and now they're back at 630. However, on Platts, they have HRC prices at 650 to 660. But I would argue that Platts is a shill for the U.S. steel mills. They basically say whatever the U.S. steel mills tell them. So I, I think the Bloomberg price is more accurate. And based on our checks with a number of contacts in the U.S. steel industry, we're hearing that X is U.S. still just sold a large amount of HRC for under 600. So we're, so we're hearing that these price hikes are not sticking. But nonetheless, that's what the market is assuming. But overall, there's a hundred dollar premium for U.S. roughly a hundred dollar premium for U.S. versus international still right now. And whenever you see that premium, imports pick up because it's cheaper to buy from international versus U.S. Well, guess what? If you look at the first what is it three weeks of March as of yesterday, right? Import licenses into the U.S for March, if you adjust for the full month, are the highest they've been since 2006. They were up roughly 15% month over month in January, roughly 3% month over month in February, and they're trending up 12% month over month in March. I'm talking about a bolus of influx of imports into the United States. You know, you can announce all the price hikes you want, but this is a global market. And pricing right now is weak because demand in China is weak because China consumes over half of the U.S. or half of the world still. So, look, U.S. still is strong because people buy when the steel mills announce price hikes, and, you know, you had two companies report misses, and the stocks are up on those misses. Uh, You know, if companies are missing earnings and uh, pricing is moving lower despite price hikes because the global market is weak, we argue you should be short that trend, and that's the trend right now for U.S. still. So, At these prices, we'd actually be shorting more because we think that there's misconceptions and misunderstandings in the market. Okay, just uh, moving on one final issue here, and I don't think you do cover it. Uh, Real good solar is getting whacked today, trading down uh, 50 cents here. It's coming into a support level of $4. Are you still, is your overall thesis on the solar stocks, does it apply to this one as well? What do they do? Uh, Real good solar incorporated. Class A kind yeah. of stock. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know exactly what they do, but I think in general, you know, the issue right now in solar in general is 
Pricing came out today. Polysilicon prices are down. Module prices are down. Cell prices are down. Wafer prices are down. I think, in general, solar industry data points, and there's a conference going on that starts today in China, um, the Beijing PV Solar Conference. The data points are going to be negative, and it very sim- simply the reason is you had a d- huge demand pull in in Q4 in China because they cut their feed-in tariff January 1st of this year. So everybody rushed to get their solar projects done before that feed-in tariff cut, and that created a, bo- a bolus of you know, pull-in demand. So in Q1 and Q2, given that you're not going to have a feed-in tariff cut in China until January 1, 2015, nobody's rushing to install solar projects, yet capacity and production of polysilicon, solar wafers, solar cells, and solar modules is still at the level that we had in Q4, i.e., you know, evident of demand of like, you know, 50 to 60 gigawatts a year, whereas demand right now is running significantly below that. So we think prices are going to continue falling. We think the data points are going to be negative through the end of 2Q and into 3Q. And given that a lot of the investors in solar are very short-term focused, we think this is going to cause, you know, a sell-off in the stocks in general. Now, clearly, there's companies that do specific things that will be worse positioned and better positioned. But in general, um, we think that is the setup for solar over the next two to three months. And given how much these stocks have run on the pulling of demand in Q4 and the expectation that was going to continue, as it becomes evident to the market that that is not continuing and things are worse, we think the solar stocks sell off in general. Okay. Now, there's, there's specific stocks we like. Well, we, we mentioned JA Solar. For the most part, we, we, we're, sh- we're short most of them. Um, but in general, I think that's the trend. Okay. We've had Gordon Johnson on, head of Alternative Energy Research and Managing Director at Axiom Capital Management, and uh, very much giving his uh, clear opinion on the outlook for solar stocks. So, Gordon, thanks a lot. We've got some more issues to cover with you. We'd like to have you on again, and uh, thank you. Have a good trading day. Thank you. Thanks for having us.